Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 118, Pirates. In 1878, workmen building the Speicherstadt, that magnificent city of warehouses in the harbour of Hamburg, made a gruesome discovery. In the mud of the Grasbrook, an island at the entrance of the medieval harbour of Hamburg emerged two piles of wood, connected by a wooden bar. An ancient beacon guiding ships. What made it so special was what was nailed onto the bar. Human skulls. Whoever these men were, they had been decapitated and their heads displayed as a warning. One of these skulls was quickly identified as that of Klaus Störtebecker, the notorious pirate. The skulls were brought to the Museum for Hamburgische Geschichte, the Museum of the History of Hamburg. There, they reconstructed the facial features of Klaus Störtebecker so that visitors can get a better picture of what Hamburg's greatest nemesis looked like. If you leave the museum and you turn right, you quickly get to Simon von Utrechtstraße, named after the man who captured Störtebecker on his agile small cog, the bunte Kuh, the painted cow. Once caught, Störtebecker was brought to the Grasbrook, where he and his 72 companions were beheaded on October 20th, 1401. As his last wish, Störtebecker asked that all the men he could walk past after his head had fallen should be freed. That wish was granted. But when the headless pirate had passed eleven of his shipmates, one of the members of the city council tripped him up, and in the end all of his men were killed, including those he had walked past. Hundreds of books have been and will still be written about Störtebecker and Simon von Utrecht. Some of those I have devoured as a child, and this is why it hurts me so much to tell you that it is all a pile of nonsense. Störtebecker lived and robbed until 1413, twelve years after his execution, which is a long time for a headless corpse. And Simon von Utrecht was just a lad when he allegedly seized Hamburg's greatest adversary. Now the story may be a tall tale, but piracy and the Victual brothers were real, and there were a real threat to the Hanse. Or at least, I believe it was. Now, before we get going, you will have to endure my 30 seconds plea for support to the show. The other day, I encountered someone who was quite successful in the podcasting business, and he suggested to me that if I were to put advertising on, the number of patrons would actually go up. The pain of listening to crypto nonsense on an infinity loop seems to be sufficiently painful for people to part with large amounts of cash, just to be able to get advertising free content. Now, I promised not to do advertising, and I stick to it. But I thought about what he said and I realized there is a way for me to achieve a similar reaction from you, and that would be for me to sing. You should know that I am from a family that has been relieved from singing classes in the seventh generation, and my in-laws have banned me from belting out O Tannenbaum at Christmas. So, here we go. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, wie grün sind deine Blätter, du blühst nicht nur zur Sommerzeit. Nein, okay, okay, stop now. You get the gist of it. So, if you want to protect your fellow listeners, and not just from the delights of Dogecoin, but also from my singing voice, become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans, or make a one-time donation at historyofthegermans.com slash support. And let's please all thank Carl, Vivian R., Matthew and Nicholas, who've already signed up. Okay, pirates. Pirates are as old as seaborne trade. Julius Caesar was captured by pirates, and Pompey cleared the Mediterranean from the menace in 66 BC, and they're still around, though the Somali pirates seem to have been got under control these last few years. We all know what a pirate is, right? Jack Sparrow throwing the grappling hook onto an unsuspecting Spanish galleon whilst the cannons roar, the snipers shoot from the crow's nest and the parrot shouts, Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Well, a pirate in the late 14th century was quite different. First up, no cannons, no snipers, no parrots, and no pieces of eight. All that did not yet exist. Well, at least not in Europe. By the time of John Sparrow, marine technology was dominated by cannon. Ships meant for combat not only carried cannon, but they were also built to sustain being shot at by cannon. 
That in turn meant that these ships were a lot heavier, needed a lot more sail and deeper draft, which in turn meant more crew. Basically, a merchantman was a very different construction and a very different crew to a warship. In the Baltic of the 14th and 15th century, there was no major difference between warships and merchant vessels. Any vessel could be turned into a naval vessel. All that needed to happen was to replace the goods storage with bunk beds for armed men. And that meant that the ship's crew too could easily be repurposed from peaceful trader in furs and wax to sailors in the navy of their hometown, or to pirate. Many an honorable merchant found himself through circumstance forced to make up losses through piracy. All it took was to tell the crew that, instead of going to load up with stockfish in Bergen, there were to do that on the high seas at the expense of some passing Dutchman. The way these encounters took place was only half as bloody as it's shown in Pirates of the Caribbean, because there were no distance weapons apart from bows and crossbows, and the main task was therefore to get close enough to the quarry to place a grappling hook to reel in the other ship, and then it was a simple question of numbers. If the attackers were 30 men and the prize had a crew of only 10, why would anyone risk a fight that results in a loss of life or limb? In particular not if this was essentially a commercial transaction. Admittedly a rather one-sided transaction, but a transaction nonetheless. And if the numbers happen to be even, the attacker is likely to give up the chase before he loses some of his own precious crew. When we hear about seriously bloody encounters, it usually happened because something in the mutual assessment of relative forces went wrong, or other non-commercial motives played a role. And all this sits in the general context of the Middle Ages. There was no monopoly on violence held by the state. It was understood and legitimate that anyone who could not gain redress in the courts was perfectly in his rights to seek satisfaction by means of violence. If that happened between landowners, it was called a feud, and it was exceedingly common. In previous seasons, we heard about the attempts of medieval monarchs and the church to restrain or regulate feuds, and how that quite regularly failed. Controlling violence on the Baltic and the North Sea was even more difficult. One reason is quite simple. A merchant vessel traveling alone is a lot more vulnerable than a merchant's caravan traveling along a busy road. A maritime attacker can disappear much quicker, and if need be, the witnesses can be sent to the bottom of the sea, never to be heard of again. Things are likely to have gotten a lot worse since the middle of the 13th century, because the two great powers, the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Denmark, were no longer able to control their subjects. And the smaller entities were even less able to exercise power over their knights and cities they were at least nominally under their rule, except maybe for the Teutonic Knights and the King of England. You remember that merchant from Danzig we heard about last week who failed to get compensation for his goods stolen by Baron Dispenser in the English courts? Well, he had one last option left. He could set upon a ship owned by the Baron Dispenser or one of his relatives and get his compensation at the point of the sword. And if he did that, nobody would describe him as a pirate. Nobody except for Dispenser, his relatives, and maybe his king. In other words, the boundaries between merchant, navy, captain, and pirate were very, very fluid. One man's pirate is another man's naval hero. In 1469, the Hanse is forced to explain its organization and purpose to the Privy Council of the King of England. And so after explaining at length what they are not, they end up saying that, quote, the Hansa Teutonica is a firm alliance of many cities, towns and communities for the purpose of ensuring that commercial enterprises on water and on land have the desired and favorable success and that effective protection is provided against pirates and highwaymen so that the merchants are not deprived of their goods and valuables by their raids. It basically says that protection from violence on land and at sea was one of the two main purposes of the Hansa. And if you look at the very early stages of the Hansa, that is exactly what the association provided. The merchants would travel together in a convoy to Novgorod, having sworn to protect each other against any attack along the way. And the more merchants joined the convoy, the safer it became, which in turn attracted more shippers to join, even if that meant they would all arrive together 
and achieve probably a lower price for their wares than if they had arrived earlier or had left later. Piracy is therefore quite obviously a major problem, and right from the very beginning. But we hear very little about pirates in the records before the late 14th century. It's in this period following the victory over Valdemar Atterdag that we suddenly get lots and lots of stories about piracy. At the heart of these stories is another association, the Victual Brothers. The Victual Brothers are described as the antithesis to the Hanseatic merchants. They are pirates who live by the slogan, God's friend and all the world's foe. This motto is inscribed on the statue of Klaus Störtebecker, the city of Hamburg had erected in 1982 on the site of his execution, which ironically has become the largest urban redevelopment project in Europe. So who were the Victual brothers? And for that, we have to go back to the Danish history in the late 14th century. You remember that when Valdemar Atterdag died in 1475, the Hanse helped to pass the crown of Denmark to his grandson, Olaf II the five-year-old son of Valdemar's daughter, Margaret. And Margaret, it turned out, was a political genius, eclipsing her already very successful father. And when Margaret took over the Kingdom of Denmark, it was still in a fragile state. The great fortresses on the Ursund were managed by the Hansards, and that meant that only a third of the much-reduced tolls for transitioning the strait came to the crown. Equally, the Hansa had blocked the Dutch and the English merchants from getting to the herring markets in Skarno and Falsterbo, which reduced its once great fair, where all kinds of products were traded, to just a place to load up on fish. This, plus the privileges of the Hansa traders, meant that the revenues from there had also shrunk considerably. Now, like her father, Margaret was a patient empire builder, just a little bit better at it. She stayed quiet and compliant until the term of Hansard occupation of the castles was over, and in 1385 took them back. And then she began pushing up the price of the tolls, thereby rebuilding the finances of the realm. In 1386 she found an at least temporary compromise on the ever-burning question of Schleswig, by agreeing that the Counts of Holstein would hold the duchy as a fief from the Danish crown. This meant that the Count was now constrained in what he could or could not do in Denmark, including he was no longer able to support the rebellious Danish nobles in Jutland. It also meant that the already messy notion of whether Schleswig was Danish or part of the Holy Roman Empire went into another painful iteration. Though it remained disputed who it belongs to for the next 550 years, the two territories, Schleswig and Holstein, are from now on united into one. Okay. That was a tiny bit of diversion. There's another territory that Margaret acquired, and that was Norway. Oh, sorry, she did not acquire it. Her son, still a minor at the time, did. Margaret's husband, King Hakon, had died in 1380, at which point the crowns of Norway and Denmark were united, in Olaf II. It will take until 1991 before Norway will get a king again, who was not either a king of Denmark or a king of Sweden, and who was born in Norway. Being Olaf II of Denmark and Olaf IV of Norway sounds quite impressive, but little Olaf had the trifecta of claims on Scandinavian crowns. His grandfather had been King Magnus IV of Sweden. If Magnus had remained on his throne, little Olaf would have smoothly picked up this crown as well. But Magnus had not held on to his crown. Fifteen years earlier, Magnus had clashed with his nobles, who regarded him as a weak ruler. He had lost Scania to Valdemar Atterdag, and he was also accused of excessive favoritism towards a young courtier, Bank Algotson. A group of rebellious nobles formed, who were then exiled by Magnus in 1363. The nobles sailed across the sea to meet up with Albrecht of Mecklenburg, the brother-in-law of Magnus and father of another Albrecht who had at least a little bit of Swedish blood through his mother. This Albrecht, it was concluded, should therefore be made King of Sweden. The project was supported by a number of German princes in some of the Hanseatic cities. They showed up in Sweden in 1364 and a civil war began between Albrecht and Magnus. In 1365 Magnus is captured and the conduct of the war is now left to Magnus's son, Hakon, who was married to the selfsame Margaret 
is also the father of little Olaf, soon king of Denmark and later king of Norway. Hakon could therefore count on support from the Danes. You still following? So we now have another theater of war in the Baltic, involving basically Norway and Denmark on one side and the German princes plus some Hanseatic cities on the other. This war is raging for a cool 31 years, from 1364 to 1395. Inside Sweden, the countryside is largely supportive of Magnus, Hakon and then finally Olaf slash Margaret, whilst the main cities, Stockholm and Kalmar, with their large population of Hanseatic German merchants, support Albrecht. Stockholm comes under siege in 1371 and Albrecht relies on Hanseatic ships to keep the cities supplied with food and weapons. For that, he turns to his Mecklenburg subjects, including the cities of Rostock and Wismar. The cities are happy to help, but it raises the question of how they should be paid. Neither the harassed king of Sweden nor his dad, the Duke of Mecklenburg, have the funds to pay for that. Now, if we were in the 18th century, the way to deal with this situation would have been to give the captains of these ships a letter of mark. That is what Francis Drake had. A letter from the king authorizing him to capture vessels of the enemy on his own account. These letters of mark made him a privateer, i.e. not a pirate, but someone who could take refuge in the harbours of the King of England with his prizes. Letters of mark as such did not exist in 1371. It would be a hundred years before the first privateer order was issued by the city of Lübeck. But the concept remained the same. The Duke of Mecklenburg authorized the ship's captains to seize enemy vessels and bring them to the harbours of Rostock and Wismar. Now, being able to seek refuge in a major trading city was crucial. Think about what is on these ships that they capture. First, beeswax, grain, herring, cloth. If you want to turn this into cash to pay your crew, repair damage to your ship, or to ultimately retire, you need a fence. A fence who can offload a couple of tons of grain, or 50 barrels of herring. Now that is not a fence. That is what we call a merchant. And that's the big difference between Baltic piracy and Captain Blackbeard. In the Caribbean, they went after the ships full of gold and silver. And that requires no fence at all. What they needed was a safe place to make repairs and maybe somewhere to get a barrel of rum and some female entertainment. But they did not need a full-service trading city that could move stolen goods into major export markets. Baltic pirates needed full-service trading cities. Rostock and Wismar were full-service trading cities. Which gets us to the next question. Who were the enemies these sea captains were permitted to attack? Well, naturally that would be Albrecht's enemies, Norway and Denmark, as well as some of the Swedish nobles. But here's the rub. Neither Norway nor Denmark had many ships. We've just gone past the peace of Stralsund and trading in the Baltic was pretty much a monopoly of the Hanse. There was some disagreement between the Mecklenburger Duke and, say, Lübeck and Stralsund, because they had signed the great peace deal with Denmark without asking him. But that was not really enough to call an outright war. And Rostock and Wismar were Hansa cities so obliged not to attack other Hansards. And finally, his main supporters in Sweden were the German merchants of Stockholm and Kalmar, who had close connections to the Hanse. So, things stayed in limbo for a while, there were some privateers that went after the rare Danish and Norwegian vessels, they even did take the occasional Hanseatic vessel and sold its content in Rostock or Wismar. When the owner protested and the other Hanseatic cities demanded that they stop fencing the stolen goods, but Rostock and Wismar then said, well, their hands were tied. As loyal subjects of their overlord, the Duke of Mecklenburg, there was nothing they could do. Ah, and it would also make them rich, so they did not really want to stop. In 1376, the Hans attack decided to raise funds and pay for a fleet to run these guys down that they called pirates. But then the Prussian cities refused to pay the tax and the whole thing petered out. Looks like Rostock and Wismar weren't the only ones playing the fencing game. That went on until 1389, when the war between Margaret of Denmark and Duke Albrecht of Mecklenburg entered its final phase. Albrecht of Sweden, so that's the younger one, was captured and his father grew desperate to get him back. In that situation, 
he went from a more informal approach to a declaration of all-out war at sea. He proclaimed that he would open all the harbors in his Duchy of Mecklenburg to, quote, anyone who was prepared to go to sea to harm the Kingdom of Denmark. Now, according to Philip Dollinger, this opened the floodgates and knights, burghers, peasants and common thieves joined the banner of Mecklenburg noblemen who fitted out ships for war. Rostock on Wismar became the headquarters of the piracy operation where raids all along the coast of Scandinavia were planned. This all-out war at sea turned the tide for Albrecht, at least for a little bit. The privateers attacked shipping all across the Baltic, but particularly in and out of the herring market in Scania. No longer did they spare the ships from Lübeck, Stralsund or Gdansk. In 1391 they took Bornholm and Gotland, then Viborg, Ebö and some other fortresses in Finland. They raided the city of Bergen in 1393 and Malmö in 1394. All goods stolen there were channeled back into the European market via Rostock and Wismar. Now these privateers came to be known as the Victual Brothers. The word is usually linked to the French word vitailleur or vittler in English. These were the detachments of soldiers sent out to procure food and drink for the army on march. But in the chaos of that Hundred Years' War, these vittlers turned into outright robbers. The term came up from France and was then attributed to the privateers. Some modern historians claim that the addition of the word brother was given to them by their enemies to create the impression that they were an organized, coherent army rather than a loose confederation of independent military entrepreneurs. Another term used for them was Likedela, referring to crews who shared the loot equally. The response of the other Hanseatic cities to the Victual Brothers was twofold. One was the obvious. They raised fleet after fleet to fight the pirates. Now the other one was a lot more effective and a lot more creative. They agreed with Queen Margaret of Denmark to shut down the herring market in Scania. This was an event of European significance. In Danzig the prices for fish tripled and further inland, say in Frankfurt, the price went up a factor of 10, making it hard, if not impossible, for the lower classes to stick to their fast days. But the embargo did work. By cutting off the trade route, pirates no longer made enough money to warrant their risks, and so many went home. The two Albrechts had to give up the struggle for the Swedish crown. In 1395, the two sides agreed a peace treaty. Albrecht, king of Sweden, was released from captivity and returned home to finish his days as duke, no longer featuring in the history books. Margaret of Denmark took over Sweden and brought the three Scandinavian kingdoms, which also included Finland, Iceland, Greenland, Faroe, etc., under the rule of one man, in an agreement known as the Kalmar Union. Now, this is the 14th century, so it had to be a man. Little Olaf, who had never gained any power alongside his mother, had died unexpectedly. So Margaret had to replace him, and she chose a young cousin, Eric of Pomerania, an equally dashing as foolish man. The three kingdoms were now ruled by the wise and energetic Margaret, and she did rule well. On this eternal back and forth between world domination and raging impotence that Denmark was now famous for, this was the brief moment in the sun. Eric would have to wait until Margaret's death in 1412 before he could make a right royal mess of things again. The capitulation of Albrecht of Mecklenburg, on the other hand, left the remaining privateers in a bit of a pickle. The harbours of Rostock and Wismar were now closed. They had acquired Gotland and with it the city of Visby. And Visby had suffered a lot in the last decades, being constantly fought over by Danes and Swedes. But there were still some merchants there and they could still fence some of the goods the sea captains brought up. The privateers were now no longer restrained by their agreement with Albrecht to attack only Denmark and its allies, so they could go out and attack anyone, irrespective of where they came from. For the cities of Lübeck and Stralsund that was unacceptable. They had taken the lead role in the military operation against the privateers so far, but they simply did not have the capacity to take Gotland on their own. Visby's famous walls, 3.6 kilometers long and protected by 51 towers, 
were beyond their siege capabilities. They needed help from a major land-based military power. The Teutonic Knights, who had been largely neutral so far, could be convinced to get involved. Not for the lofty goal of creating safe shipping lines, but because they were interested in taking Gotland for themselves. In 1398, the Grand Master Konrad of Jungingen mustered 84 ships and 4,000 men and sailed for Visby. He took the city with ease and held it for the following 10 years. There is a Swedish folk song that described Visby as follows. With hundredweight, they weighed their gold. They played with precious stones. Their women used golden distaffs and pigs ate out of silver troughs. When the Teutonic Knights left in 1408, there was no gold, no silver and no precious stone left in Visby. The place emptied out and by the 16th century all the churches were abandoned except for St. Mary, the church of the Gotlandfahrer. It depends very much on your nationality whether you blame Valdemar Atterdag's siege of 1361, the pirates or the Teutonic Knights for the fall of this once great center of Baltic trade. The only thing we can agree on is that it is gone. And who else is gone from the Baltic are the privateers. Without a base where to offload and sell their loot, piracy on the scale they had been operating at was no longer viable. Most of them, I guess, just went home and live out their last years as honored members of the city council. Some relocated to the North Sea. And there they found a new base amongst the chieftains of Ostfriesland. Yes, chieftains. In Germany they are called Häuptling, the same word we use for leaders of the Native Americans. These guys were another leftover of the days when the Germanic tribes scaled the walls of the Roman forts. They weren't aristocrats in the classic feudal sense, but elected leaders of free men. They settled in East Frisia, the land roughly between Bremen and Groningen on the North Sea coast. They operated outside the general structure of the Holy Roman Empire, being neither subjects of a territorial prince nor of the emperor. These guys gave refuge to the remaining Victual brothers, who now harassed the ships traveling along the coast from Hamburg and Bremen to Flanders. And this is where the famous Klaus Störtebecker appears for the first time. There was no record of him when the Victual brothers were riding high in Rostock, Wismar or Visby at all. Now he was allegedly the great leader of the Victual brothers, enjoying the hospitality of the Frisian chieftains. In 1400, the cities of Hamburg and Bremen mustered a fleet and defeated the Frisian chieftains. The chieftains signed an agreement never ever to hire the Victual brothers again. The following year, the Victual brothers were back in East Frisia. The chieftains said that these guys just weren't Victual brothers, just common mercenaries. The Hamburgers returned and defeated the Frisians again and made them sign another agreement, now promising not only to let any Victual brothers in, but also no robbers, no pirates or any other malefactors. It is on that later raid that Klaus Störtebecker was allegedly captured and then brought to Hamburg, where he and his men were executed and after that there was no more piracy harassing the Hanseatic trade ever again. Ah, no, piracy did not stop. Simon von Utrecht, that Hamburg naval hero who allegedly defeated Störtebecker at the tender age of maybe 15, fought pirates well into the 1430s. The Victual brothers kept popping up in Hanse documents until about 1470, and after 1470, Lübeck issued a detailed ordinance about how to run a legitimate privateer operation. The most famous act of piracy post Störtebecker occurred in 1473. The Hanseatic League was at war with King Edward IV of England. Paul Benecke, a city councillor from Danzig, sailed under a letter of mark, chasing English merchantmen. He commanded the largest ship in the Hanseatic fleet, the Peter of Danzig, 51 meters long with a displacement of 1,600 tons. Just to put that in context, the Santa Maria that carried Columbus to the Caribbean was just 19 meters long with a displacement of about 108 tons. Whilst cruising off the shore of Zeeland, not far from Sluis, the Peter von Danzig comes upon a galley leaving Bruges. This galley was ostensibly owned by Tommaso Portinari, the manager of the Medici Bank branch in Bruges, and flew the flag of neutral Burgundy. 
Still, Binnaker approached and demanded to know whether any English goods were on board. The captain of the galley laughs out loud and points at the large Burgundian banner. An altercation ensues, shots are fired. Benneke and his men capture the galley. Later they will say they found English merchandise on board and prove that it was in fact owned by King Edward IV. We do not know whether that is true. What is certain, though, is that they found something quite valuable on board. The Last Judgment A large triptych by the great Flemish painter Hans Mimling. It had been commissioned by another Medici agent in Bruges, Andrea Tani, and was destined to go to Florence. Binneke takes that painting and puts it into the church of St. Mary in his hometown, where it stayed until it became the star exhibit in the Gdansk National Museum. The Medici mobilized the Pope to demand the return of the painting to its rightful owner, but the city council of Danzig refused, claiming it to be a legitimate prize. In the 19th century, Binneke became a national hero. Not of the Poles, obviously, but of the Germans residing in Danzig. The Nazis built a memorial shrine for Binneke, complete with statue and mural. On the other end of the political spectrum, Günther Grass makes up a grandiose tall tale about the figurehead of the galleon that Binneke captured. One man's pirate is another man's naval hero. So, pirates existed before the Victual brothers and Klaus Störtebecker, and they existed long afterwards, assuming the latter existed at all. Which leaves the question why this story has become such an icon of Hanseatic history. To get to the bottom of it would require a full review of the perception history of the Hanseatic League, which we will do, but at the end of this series, as we always do. But... There is also a question why the Victual brothers kept getting discussed on contemporaneous Hanse Tage as a huge threat to the association. One reason may have been that these pirates needed to be portrayed as a huge danger to each individual city in order to justify the raising of taxes to fight them. But I believe there is something more profound at work here. Remember what the Hanse is for, as per the statement of 1479, which is not just to protect the traders from pirates and robbers, but primarily to ensure, quote, that commercial enterprises on water and on land have the desired and favorable success. And the way they do that is by reducing friction in trade. They gain privileges in key trading centers abroad. The Hanseatic cities adopt either Lübeck or Magdeburg law, which meant they had similar rules about trade and shipping, and these rules were enforced by unbiased courts. Merchants in the Hanse had a vast network of personal relationships across the different cities, be it because they had been apprenticed in another city, because they had spent a winter in Novgorod or in Bergen with their fellow Hansards. Maybe they had sailed to Bruges or London with others, had found their wives in distant shores or married their daughters to colleagues within the network. Carsten Janke describes the financial interrelationships between these networks and points out that merchants were constantly holding goods and funds in trust for each other. To function, these networks required each member to be trustworthy and predictable. And that is why the Victual brothers were a major shock to the system. There was piracy or privateering before 1370, but it was mostly directed against explicit opponents, and usually not against members of the Hanse. Now, when Rostock and Wismar took part in this large-scale operation and were trading the stolen goods through other Hansards in other cities, the system of mutual trust was at risk of collapse. Networks like the one that dominate the internet today can take some proportion of dishonest players. Just think about TripAdvisor, which still has some credibility despite a lot of fake reviews. Once a network is overrun by dishonest actors, though, it loses validity and then collapses. And the leaders of the Hanse must have seen this danger, and that is why they reacted so strongly, and that is also why they kept the memory of the Victual brothers alive. The story of the Victual brothers is therefore much less of a story about pirates, but a story about the Hanseatic League itself and its ability to heal. Violence at sea continued well after Störtebecker was allegedly beheaded, but no city would harbour privateers attacking other Hanse members as openly and on a scale as Rostock and Wismar have done. 
As for the former fences in Rostocker and Wismar, they return to be honest merchants, and their descendants proudly display their HR and HW number plates. Now next week we'll talk a bit more about what the Hanse actually was, how it operated and why the English described it as a crocodile, a dangerous animal, the body and strength of which was always hidden below the surface. I hope you will join us again. Now, instead of the usual closing speech referencing patreon.com slash history of the Germans or history of the Germans.com slash support, I thought I'll give you the chapter in the tin drum from Günter Grass talking about the National Maritime Museum in Gdansk and the figurehead of the galleon. Quote, the pride of the collection was the figurehead from a large Florentine galleon which, though its home port was Bruges, belonged to the Florentine merchant Portinari and Tani. The Danzig pirates and city captains Paul Benecke and Martin Bardewick had managed to capture the galleon in April of 1473 whilst tacking off the coast of Zeeland near the port of Sluis. Soon after its capture, most of the crew, as well as the officers and captain, were put to the sword. The ship and its cargo were brought to Danzig. A folding triptych of the Last Judgment by the artist Memling and a golden baptismal font, both commissioned by the Florentine Tani for a church in Florence, were displayed in the Church of the Virgin Mary. The Last Judgment, so far as I know, brings pleasure to this day to the Catholic eye of Poland. What became of the figurehead after the war remains unclear. In my day, it was kept in the Maritime Museum. A voluptuous wooden woman, green and naked, her arms raised and languidly crossed, all fingers on view, gazed ahead with sunken amber eyes across breasts striving towards their goal. This woman, this figurehead, brought disaster. The merchant Potinari had commissioned it modelled on a Flemish maiden he was close to, from a sculptor who'd made a name for himself carving figureheads. The carved green figure was barely mounted beneath the bowsprit of the galleon when the maiden, as was customary back then, was tried for witchcraft. Before she went up in flames, having been asked a few painful questions with regard to her patron, she accused the merchant from Florence, as well as the sculptor who had measured her so carefully. It said Portinari hanged himself, because he feared the fire. As for the sculptor, they chopped off both his gifted hands to prevent him from turning any more witches into figureheads. While the trials were still underway in Bruges and causing a stir, as Portinari was a rich man, the galleon with its figurehead fell into the piratical hands of Paul Benneke. Signor Tani, the second merchant, fell beneath the pirate's grappling iron. Paul Benneke was next. A few years later he fell out of favour with the petitions of his native city and was drowned in the courtyard of the Stockton. Ships to whose bows the figurehead was affixed after Benneke's death burst into flames while still in the harbour, shortly after she was in place, and spread fire to other ships. Everything burned except, of course, for the figurehead itself. It was fireproof and with its shapely curves always found new admirers amongst the ship owners. No sooner had this woman taken her accustomed place, however, than once peaceful crews broke out in mutiny against her back and decimated each other. The failed expedition of the Danzig fleet against Denmark in the war of 1522, under the leadership of the highly talented Eberhard Ferber, led to Ferber's downfall and bloody insurrections in the city. History speaks of religious conflicts. In 23, a Protestant pastor named Hegge led a mob in an iconoclastic assault on the city's seven parish churches, but we prefer to place the blame for this long-standing disaster on the figurehead. She graced the bow of Ferber's ship. When, 50 years later, Stefan Bathory besieged the city in vain, Kaspar Jeschke, abbot of the cloister of Olivia, delivered penitential sermons in which he blamed the figurehead, the sinful woman. The king of the Poles, who had received her as a gift from the city, took her along on his field camp and was badly advised by her. The extent to which the wooden lady influenced the Swedish campaign against the city and impelled the long incarceration of Dr. Egidius Schrach, who had conspired with the Swedes and had demanded that the green maiden 
who'd meanwhile found her way back to the city, be burned is unknown. A somewhat murky report maintains that a poet by the name of Opitz left Silesia and sought refuge for a few years in the city but died an early death because he hunted down the insidious carving in a storeroom and tried to sing verses to her. Only towards the end of the 18th century, at the time of the various petitions of Poland, did the Prussians, who were forced to take the city by storm, issue a royal Prussian decree against the wooden figure Niobe. For the first time, she was mentioned by name in an official document and evacuated to, or more precisely incarcerated in, that same Stockturm in the courtyard of which Paul Benecke was drowned, and from the gallery of which I successfully tested my first long-distance song, so that, confronted by the most refined products of human imagination, instruments of torture, she would hold her peace for the whole of the 19th century. When in 1932 I climbed the Stockturm and ravaged the lobby windows of the Stadttheater with my voice, Niobe, popularly known as the Green Maiden, had, thank God, long since been removed from the tower's torture chamber. Otherwise, who knows whether my assault on the neoclassical edifice would have succeeded. It must have been some uninformed museum director from out of town who fetched Niobe from the torture chamber where she'd been held in check and installed her in a newly furnished maritime museum shortly after the founding of the Free State. Soon thereafter, the overzealous man died from a case of blood poisoning he'd brought on himself whilst putting up a sign saying that the lady displayed above it was a figurehead answering to the name Niobe. His successor, a cautious man well acquainted with the city's history, wanted to move Niobe out again. His idea was to present the dangerous wooden maiden to the city of Lübeck, and it was only because the citizens of Lübeck refused the gift that, except for its brick churches, the little city on the Trave made it through the wartime air raids relatively unscathed. So Niobe or the Green Maiden remained in the Maritime Museum and over the period of barely 14 years of museum history caused the death of two directors. Not the cautious one, he'd managed to get himself transferred, the expiration of an elderly priest at her feet, the violent end of a student from the engineering school and two seniors from St. Peter's Gymnasium who had just passed their final exams and the demise of four reliable museum guards, most of them married. They were all found, including the engineering student, with transfigured countenances and chests impaled by sharp instruments of the sort kept only in the Maritime Museum. Sailors' knives, grapnel, harpoons, finely chiseled spear tips from the Gold Coast, sailmakers' needles and only the last of the gymnasium students had been forced to resort first to his pocket knife and then to his school compass, since shortly before his death all sharp objects in the museum had either been chained up or placed behind glass. Although the detectives from the homicide squad described each death as a tragic case of suicide, a rumour ran through the city and the newspapers too. The Green Maiden's doing it with her own hands. Niobe was seriously suspected of having dispatched men and boys to the other world. The discussions went back and forth. Columns were set aside in newspapers for the free expression of opinions of the Niobe case. People termed them sinister events. The city administration spoke of outmoded superstition. They had no intention of taking any precipitate action till they had proof that something supernatural had really and truly occurred. And so the green figure remained the showpiece of the Maritime Museum since the Regional Museum in Olivia, the City Museum on Fleischergasse and the administration of the Artushof all refused to take in the man-crazy creature. End quote. The story does not end here, as you can imagine. There will be a death and sex before the chapter is out. And if you like such frolicking fables that portray a forgotten face of history, as much as the Nobel Committee did when they awarded him the prize for literature in 1999, get yourself a copy of The Tin Drum. I enjoyed it. <laughs>